Welcome to Crime Beyond Borders, a podcast series from the Journal of Illicit Economies and Development and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. My name is John Collins and I'm Editor-in-Chief of the Journal. Let's start off by briefly explaining what the Journal of Illicit Economies and Development, also known as JIAD, is. JIAD is an independent academic journal run by the Global Initiative and published by LSE Press. It's a peer-reviewed, open-access, electronic journal publishing research on the relationship between illicit markets and development. You can find a link to the website in the summary to this episode. In this second episode, we're going to discuss the relationship between illicit economies and the concept of urban peace. In particular, we're going to look at the application of urban peace as a way of thinking about policy responses to the dynamics of crime, violence and exclusion that are associated with illicit economies. With me, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Dr. Achim Venman, who is Senior Researcher of the Graduate Institute of Geneva's Centre on Conflict, Development and Peacebuilding, CCDP, and also the Institute's Director for Strategic Partnerships. Mirva Kanya is an advisor for the German Development Cooperation, GIZ, in a decentralization and local development support project in Libya. Antonio Sampaio is a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and focuses on urban violence and the intersection of illicit economies and armed conflict. And Rachel Locke, Director of Impact Peace at the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice. So Akim, if I can turn to you first as an editor of the special issue. For those who are unfamiliar with the topic of urban peace, could you give our listeners maybe an introduction to the ideas underpinning urban peace, and then perhaps tell us a little bit about the genesis of the idea for this special issue? Uh, Thank you so much, John. So many of the listeners will be well aware that many urban contexts have really been shaped by, uh, by rather violent responses to violence itself. So there has been a proliferation of uh, heavy-handed approaches to managing violence and, and insecurity in cities. And that has led to uh, um, self-reinforcing spirals of violence and, and, and spirals of, of, of insecurity. So there's a great need of finding alternative approaches to dealing with uh, issues such as urban crime or, or urban violence. And this special issue wanted to really change the perspective on this and say what happens when we are looking at illicit economies through the lens of urban peace. And so we, we are connecting to a whole series of research in, in, in political science and in particular also a lot of field research which has been done by from, from, from urban, uh, urban geographers to anthropologists to, uh, to pe- people who just practically work on violence reduction, many of those having a special uh, voice in this, in, in, in this issue. Um, where we really wanted to focus on approaches that are based on connectedness, proximity, and trust um, between individuals, different segments of society, and divided urban spaces. Because that really sets alternative approaches apart from other um, efforts, which are essentially based on separation, distance, and enmity um, that are well known to be associated with uh, securitized and zero tolerance and, and counter-terror pr- approaches. Um, why this is important? Um, well, uh, we, we thought it is important to highlight in the special issue uh, that there are indeed other approaches available because very frequently politicians and, and, uh, and, and other sectors who really argue for securitized approaches just say this is really the only game in town and there's no alternatives. But here we really show there is another game in town. There are alternative approaches. There's a lot of empirical evidence behind them, how they work, and how in some contexts they can be much more effective to to expand the toolbox in dealing with illicit economies. And also, well, really to achieve a a bigger goal, which is that of a higher degrees of both negative and positive peace. Um, The other reason why we really wanted to focus on, on the issue of urban peace and illicit economies is to take the notion of illicit economies outside of a, a very a very polarized type of understanding. Um, a lot of the literature on illicit, illegal, informal, and so forth economies uh, are really kind of polarized, a uh, uh, pole towards what is uh, legal, legitimate, and, uh, and recognized state control. So we wanted to recognize that in the real world, these kind of illicit economies are really much more integrated, a much more part of a holistic understanding of the economy, um, which is neither formal or informal, which is neither state-controlled or not, but which is really defined by a 
a significant degree of hybrid energy, both in terms of the politics associated to this and in terms of, the, of course, also the, the approaches which are associated to it to engage in that space. So I think the journal sets out a lot of fascinating empirical examples of how the urban peace and illicit economies um, plays out in a lot of different contexts from classic uh, urban violence contexts uh, that we all know from South America, but also other contexts from, from the Philippines uh, to the Middle East and, uh, and, and also in Southern Africa. So a very wide degree of empirical evidence which we put out there uh, into the research community and also those interested in this topic in practice um, that you can draw on. Back, back to you, John. Yeah, very, very interesting. And I think you, you really hit the nail on the head where you have these um, classical examples of urban violence and the narratives around those and the securitized responses to those. And, you know, as, as a drug, drug specialist, I can certainly uh, relate to that. But I think one of the real innovations of the special issue is that we've brought in some really unique and very interesting uh, examples of this topic and very interesting empirical examples. So maybe if I could go to Antonio next. Um, Antonio, in your article, you talk about urban resources for armed groups. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit further on your research and, and how you made the link to this debate and what you feel it contributes to this debate? Sure. Thank you, John. Um, so uh, the, the idea for the article that is now part of the uh, special edition on urban peace came from um, field research that I did alongside uh, a colleague, uh, back when I was at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, um, on we wanted to to look at how cities, large cities, located not precisely inside conflict areas, not urban warfare, but cities located near armed conflict, were affected by uh, by violence, by the presence of non-state armed groups, and uh, we visited quite a few. Uh, well, we visited four cities that were in our definition, uh, located close to armed conflict. And during that time, I was quite surprised by how often the interviewees um, would point out that these, these linkages, um, this effect of armed conflict or how these armed groups were operating in the city were actually economic linkages uh, with, through illicit economies, criminalized activities, um, the sort of indirect um, um, presence of these armed groups. And actually, um, the issue of terrorism itself, for instance, in Kabul and Mogadishu, uh, back in the day when Kabul was still uh, controlled by a non-Taliban government, the issue of terrorism was uh, surprisingly relatively low in the, um, in the responses that we got in terms of uh, the main concerns of these, um, of these people, because the um, the, the, the main the main activity that they were trying to 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 tackle was um, was the presence of these groups through economic means because it was also part of how they operated in those cities. So um, the the and, and from that uh, I I really started to think about these illicit economies that are exploited not by purely um, economic or purely materialistic motives. Uh, and groups, but also uh, by groups that are linked to more ideological, political, and even sometimes even religious extremist uh, um, uh, causes. So the concept of urban resources that I, I explain in the in the in the article is really the um, the, the instruments that make these cities attractive for armed groups. So in traditional conflict studies or in, and theories of armed conflict, cities have all, all have traditionally been considered um, areas hostile to rebel groups, insurgents, etc., because they are closer to government uh, security forces. But in fact, with the perhaps the recent trends, um, recent as in, the, in recent decades um, of rapid urbanization in both developing and, and fragile contexts, uh, really, the opportunities for these armed groups to exploit um, service provision, to extort businesses in cities because of overstretched and overwhelmed uh, law enforcement and rule of law and other state institutions, I believe, has increased. Um, so, so urban resources are really the instruments, uh, the, um, the the list economies that 
um, armed groups uh, exploiting cities for material gain, but also linked to their political agenda. So it, it strengthens the political agendas through the, the, the profit that they make, but also by uh, allowing these groups to have a presence in these cities and, for instance, to replace the state in some, in some areas as essentially tax collectors. Um, so these are the urban resources that, that make cities attractive uh, for armed groups to make them, you know, um, brave the cities and risk being closer to government security forces um, for, for the profit and for the, the opportunity that they offer. Very interesting, yeah. And, and um, uh, Rachel, at, at, as we think of this at a, as, at a conceptual level at the outset, um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about, based on your article and your work, how our, 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 shape, our narratives shape or influence our thinking about our responses to organized crime? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think it's worth sort of, again, at the conceptual level, starting with understanding that very often the way that we speak about crime, about organized crime uh, in particular, is in sort of technical, cold, or definitive ways. Um, so that's very often rooted in legal structures and systems. We talk about reinforcing the rule of law. And what we neglect in those conversations is to understand that all of the language that we're using and the um, the legal doctrine that we are applying is all shaped. It's all shaped by, by people, um, very often shaped by people in positions of power and authority. Um, and it shifts and changes over time, but we, without a sort of historical context to how we are even at the very outset labeling or talking about groups or individuals, what is allowed to happen, what we allow to happen is the creation of pretty over, overly simplified narratives and the creation of um, sort of discussion of rule of law and discussion of criminal activity that is ahistorical, that is um, not rooted in a full understanding of power inequalities and power systems and structures. So for example, in my own country here in the U.S., um, in many in many states, uh, loitering is considered a crime, right? Um, and uh, that people are the people who are punished for that crime, the people who are uh, arrested and prosecuted for that crime, are almost always the people who are already disenfranchised and marginalized by the state. Most typically. Um, black and brown individuals. So there is a clear sort of connection between power structures, between um, the way that those power structures shape and form the narrative, and the way that that narrative then gets embedded into what what um, becomes sort of simplified, technical, um, ahistorical, and non kind of um, uh, diagnosed diagnostically clear systems of power. Um, so I think that's a really important thing for us to acknowledge at the outset um, and to acknowledge that very often when there is a, a spike in violence or there is a spike in criminal activity or some kind of crisis, and then ha this obviously has been particularly um, paramount in the last two years as we have seen the rapid rise in uh, some forms of violence and some forms of criminality, although alongside drops in other forms as a result of or connected to the dynamics of the pandemic, that when there is some kind of crisis or some kind of sp uh, spike, this creates even more space for the pre-existing narratives to be used to come into the fore for very um, typically heavy-handed kind of state-led responses that do not take into account the need to be much more diagnostically clear and the need to be much more um, kind of understanding, again, of the, the historic um, disparities that may be contributing to or leading to the spike in violence. So in other words, increased violence creates a demand for the state to do something about it the state 
response to that demand by reinforcing already typically kind of discriminatory, ahistorical, and often punitive and rep- repressive responses. That collection of responses does very little, in fact, to reduce violence um, in the medium to long term. It can have effectiveness in reducing violence in the short term. I use the word can with emphasis, um, but it does nothing and studies have shown this to reduce violence and criminality in the medium to long term. More distressing, those types of responses, and Akim spoke about these in his um, comments at the beginning of the conversation, do nothing to reverse the structural inequalities within the system. Uh, And even more to the point, they very often reinforce those structural inequalities. So if you have Um, a a state that is applying repressive, punitive, high incarceration measures um, and reinforcing that, then all that does is continue to strengthen the state and to disenfranchise and delegitimize those that the state uh, is sharing a story of being um, criminal or illegitimate or illicit, or whatever words are used, as it reinforces these power structures. It does nothing to lower your violence levels, and it reinforces inequality within the system. It's um, really, really important that we push forward and these conceptual kind of challenges, if you will, to the way in which we talk about criminality writ large, violence writ large, so that in the best of times, we can be reforming our systems in such a way that leads to more restorative practices, that leads to more equality within the system. And so that in the worst of times, again, when you have a crisis or a spike, that we're not kind of um, uh, bouncing back to the most knee-jerk reaction and creating space for more repression and more punitive measures. Very interesting. And, and, and I think in that, in that vein of and, and focusing on elite actors, uh, Merve, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about your work uh, focusing on the role of elite actors in, in localized political uh, settlements and what sort of concrete approaches we can use to understand uh, these issues? Of course. Uh, thank you, John. So um, as Rachel's article speaks about um, labeling and referring to such as illicit actors and, and narratives, um, mine really uh, tries to argue and make a case for that we need to find some pra- practical um, solutions to engaging with them. Um, and I draw from the context of Syria, so bring um, the special issue to, to another setting, the context of war in cities. And, and argue that um, drawing from both uh, literature and emerging insights that, are, that have been written uh, by various scholars from various fields for many years, that um, uh, peace building needs to change and needs to localize and needs to engage with uh, such illicit actors. And um, as, a, as a potential way for doing so, I suggest uh, supporting insider mediators. And... Um, for that, um, I, I draw on the one hand from uh, field work I've uh, conducted on the case of Syria, particularly um, the case of reconstruction in uh, two neighborhoods in Damascus and housing, rent, and property rights there. Um, interviews with uh, civil servants from uh, the by then current, but also former Syrian government, as well as aid actors, and how um, their approaches are working um, or not so much. Um, as well as the uh, literatures um, that I've already mentioned. Um, and the cases really, really show, particularly from uh, the insights on the ground in the two neighborhoods, Basatina, Razi and Kaboon, that um, uh, local actors um, that are recognized by the people on the ground and all the conflict parties um, that are involved in the Syrian conflict are able to shape um, the interests that are up for debate, um, perhaps what Antonio in his article is referring to as, as urban resources, so to say, just in, a, in, the, in the context of a conflict in the city or conflict over 
uh, these urban resources in the in the city at Rho, um, uh, and that they can um, change the outlook um, of warring parties in um, to a conflict. Very interesting. Um, and, and I guess to, to bring it back and to, to broaden it a slightly, because we've heard a very, very uh, impressive array of, of geographic coverage of, of this special issue already. But Akin Gray, perhaps as, as, as one of the issue editors, you could tell us a little bit more about some of the, the other areas that were covered and uh, some of the other examples that we saw throughout the special issue. Yeah, John, and let me perhaps uh, do so by looking at some of the, 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 the lessons learned which are coming out of this. Now, I think there's a, an under, underpinning story which comes out of the, out of the case studies, the empirical material, um, which is about the, the, the key strategic importance of the illicit and the informal economies in cities as a source of resilience um, for people and um, in, in light of ever-increasing challenges with which they're facing. So if we're looking at the, uh, at the amount of uh, turbulences which cities are going to uh, experience in the future with respect to climate change, geopolitical changes, and also technological innovations, um, a lot of the resilience factors are exactly rooted in this illicit and informal economy. Hence, if we really want to unlock this, this, field, of, um, this field of resilience, uh, many of the cases show how this can be done by adopting so-called multidimensional approaches. Um, um, so if we're looking at the, 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 the case of Thailand, for instance, it was fascinating uh, to see how different kind of actors uh, work together in diversifying off-farm income through value-added processing, entrepreneurship, trading services, and tourism, um, and uh, other demand-side issues. So that was fascinating how different constituencies brought together different ways of working in order to uh, to diversify in this case from an over reliance of the drug economy now if we are looking at a study of Cracolandia in sao paulo for instance we we can we could see how uh, different approaches included the housing and relocation policies uh, work on the promotion of income generation and also health and and social follow up with with specific target groups so all of this points to the fact that this 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 uh, infatuation about heavy-handed approaches, you know, to be the 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 the, the instrument that that solves it all, is, is completely one-sided and of, is is somewhat blinding. In fact, it it made me in the in the conclusion of the of the special issue to reflect about how in fact antibiotics work, um, that basically try to uh, uh, act like a sledgehammer on the body. Um, in order to to try to to get everything out of the body which is not supposed to be there, and in a sense, heavy-handed approaches and securitized approaches work in the same way. And we all know if you take too much too much antibiotics, um, they're not going to they, they they won't work anymore. You no. Know? So here it is not, and this is another lesson which comes out of the case studies. It's not necessarily about no heavy-handedness or no securitized approaches or no no. Uh, pressure politics no it's about really understanding the right dosage of these instruments of the use of these instruments but as part of much 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 bigger uh, in, in instruments um, so the quintessence what the case studies show um, again one of these these uh, these these things that run way through the case studies is the need for strong coordination and of course if you have to bring together and and make different constituencies and policy approaches work together, you need to have somewhere the, the, the coordinating hand that, that makes it all work. And the strength of these coordination mechanisms have also defined the, uh, the utility and the successfulness of these multidimensional approaches to work. But this also created a caveat, because having these capabilities of very uh, well-organized uh, capabilities that are already in systems in cities is not something that is in, uh, in, in, uh, in a very healthy supply in most cities. So one has to also uh, uh, develop a kind of a, a, a sense of humility um, in the uh, deployment of these multidimensional approaches and really adapt the type of uh, 
element, the type of instruments uh, that are deployed uh, and that are mobilized in a sense to to the um, to the to the to the capacities which are um, uh, existing in environments. Now, a, a final point which I I'd, I'd, I'd come to. Uh, is the notion that Rachel spoke to the the importance of a granular understanding uh, and the territoria- also of the territoriality of the illicit economies. Because under- having that granular understanding really makes all the difference in terms of not falling into the trap of uh, the, 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 the use of overlies generally policy approaches to wanting to unlock in illicit economies. So where this overall points to, is uh, towards an agenda of co-production, no? because you really need to identify the existing capabilities which are in, in the, available in cities in order to, uh, to uh, find responses to, uh, to exits to illicit economies or to, to make illicit economies, in fact, work for, 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 for resilience and for positive uh, development outcomes. Um, but also to find, in fact, the way to, to coordinate and, uh, and, and to bring these together. Here, uh, Merve spoke uh, on the, the insider mediators. Um, there are other uh, actors which need to be considered, not just in the formal space, but also in the, the hybrid political economy that, that, of course, Antonio pointed to. But overall, um, what the special issue points to is are situations that are really happening in any city around the world. Uh, so these are not just a handful of case studies which are which we have which we have selected, but for us as the editors, these are case studies which are showcasing broader trends, uh, which exist in the multitude of hundreds and hundreds of cities which are out there, and which are growing very rapidly at the moment, and which will be the future flashpoint of violence and insecurity. Very interesting. Yeah, thanks, Akim. And and maybe if I could use the host prerogative as, as as somebody who contributed to one of the case studies as well to just you know I, this this may seem quite a conceptual discussion, but there's very significant pragmatic implications for it. And um, you know, if I think of the drugs discussion, where we have a, a UN Commission on Narcotics Drugs, we have a UN Secretariat, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and they have a specific mandate and a specific way of looking at this issue. And when we try to break down that silo and try to pri- apply the principles of urban peace to some of these discussions around development or alternative development uh, with regard to drugs, and we use the case study, as you mentioned, of Thailand and, and, and this, this specific uh, uh, project that's being run in North, northern tr- Thailand to try to apply principles of development to, to areas affected by urban drug trafficking, you run into very significant institutional ob- obstacles to do that. And there is no crossover of discussions between these various parts of the UN and these various mandates and these various agencies trying to address what is fundamentally the same issue, right? Uh, Conflict, violence, insecurity, all these issues. But they're all taking a very siloed approach to understanding it, to, to, to dissecting the problem and trying to come up with policy responses. So in the UN case, for example, um, we talk about urban development or sorry, we talk about alternative development with regard to drugs. And certain parts of the UN say that purely means rural. That does not apply to urban or anything to do with urban and drugs is the, is the realm of criminality and, and crime control. And so you can't have an actual open discussion on the ideas of development or in this case, urban peace uh, and drug control because there's just not the institutional mechanism in place. So I think the, the focus of the article in Akim, I think your role really as, as, as editor in this was, was bringing this conceptual uh, understanding and, and, and trying to give us more of a, a common uh, guidebook to have some of these discussions. So I think that's, that's really where some of the real innovation of the special issue was. Just a quick message to those listening. Jayad welcomes submissions for our open issues regularly. It can be research, a review, letter, policy commentary, and other options. Recently, we've had pieces on corruption, mafia groups, drug trafficking, environmental crimes, and many more. For more information, head over to the Jayad website. There's a link in the summary to the show. Anyway, back to my role as host. Uh, If we were then to continue down this path and, and, and think about the pragmatic approaches, um, Antonio, could you tell us a bit more about your work and, and what you think some of the pragmatic lessons are? What, what can policymakers take away from it? Uh, and, and how can they implement some of the lessons learned? Yeah, this discussion really made me think about um, the specificity of the urban environment. And uh, one way that I always told my, my colleagues, uh, both in 
the organization that was working on and other researchers that were not so focused on the urban dimension of violence is that the the the, the reason we are we are studying the urban environment so much uh, so much and so specifically and the reason why there has been uh, in the several few years but uh, there has been a booming in, in, really in research on urban violence and urban drivers of conflict, I believe, is because there is a sense that there is something um, specific and uh, something that can be generalized to other cities about the, the forms of violence uh, that occur in cities. For instance, um, the spatial inequalities in the city is something that is quite universal and something that affects, you know, uh, um, um, violence in, in different contexts, the way that uh, informal settlements tend to be marginalized from services and that, you know, provides opportunities for, for armed groups. Um, the sort of political divisions that play out at the urban space, the sort of ethnic and, and sectarian divisions in some cities, you can have broader ethnic and sectarian tensions in a country such as um, Kenya with the different uh, tribes, in Somalia with the different clans. Um, and, but in the city, it plays out quite in a concentrated way and the form that these different ethnicities fight for um, influence or for control, the way that they set up vigilante groups or militias that then fight with each other. One of my case studies was about Karachi in Pakistan during the early 2010s when uh, rival political parties, each one uh, linked to specific sort of ethnicities, um, really fought among each other for control of illicit economies, but these illicit economies were then, and land, and these resources were then used as political tools for these armed groups to, and, and the associated parties to then um, uh, give out or, or favor their constituencies uh, in prejudice of, of the other. Uh, so, so these these sort of interests are profoundly linked to the specific urban environment. They wouldn't have such um, rich and and valuable resources concentrated in such a density, in such small spaces in a rural area. You know, so that's not to say that the uh, violence in rural areas, of course, is not important, but that the urban environment also has a specific sort of um, sort of linked uh, problems that are that that deserve uh, greater attention and all of that to say that um, understanding that there are uh, drivers of violence that are linked to the urban space and to urban development that it is really a challenge for urban for policymakers to um, come up with solutions that address these more deep-rooted political social issues in cities uh, the the way that uh, as Rachel described and as Akin also, also mentioned, the sort of uh, excessive use of the purely repressive tools of the state, uh, to me, um, sound like a, um, a lazy sort of uh, policy response because you're, you're, you're in the hopes of defeating an armed group, um, which is a model that, you know, uh, is more applicable to, to old-style wars in the, in the rural area, and you're not really addressing the um, the opportunities, the the governance gaps, and the illicit economies that you know we in the in the expert community have been pointing out and providing evidence about for many many decades. You know, um, so 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 I think that the, the these findings, these articles, and uh, this research really provides opportunities for policymakers to go deeper into these. Um, drivers and 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 socioeconomic and development issues that are uh, more profound than simply shipping out um, uh, police officers to raid, you know, a certain a certain number of urban area. Yeah, interesting. And Rachel, I, I think that that leads in nicely to, to to your work. So maybe you could think a little bit further about some of these pragmatic lessons, or pragmatic lessons, and, and maybe even some specific examples that you've worked on. Um, so I, I will, but I, before I get into pragmatic lessons, um, I do think there's two points that are, that are worth making. Um, one going back to what John was speaking about in terms of, sorry, uh, John, to what you were speaking about in terms of the UN, uh, system. I think, um, it is worth reinforcing over and over again 
that um, the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 created a, a universal and integrated framework for action. And yet the, the less that we speak about it and the less that we invoke uh, the fact that this framework for action exists, which uh, as articulated should allow for, and not just allow for, but compel the different actors within our uh, UN system, our multilateral system, uh, to work together towards these ambitious goals and targets, um, the less that we speak to that, the more that we allow for that fragmentation to continue, which says that, you know, crime uh, or that that we only talk about sort of um, illicit activities with a criminality based approach and we don't connect it to what's happening from a development perspective and we don't connect it to a human rights perspective and we don't think about inclusion and what's required for peaceful societies and how we advance justice for all, right? So my article also really tries to point out that there is this space that's been created by Agenda 2030, but the creation of space does nothing unless you actually leverage that space that's been created. And I fear that we have put a lot of work into creating this agenda and then just sort of letting it sit on the shelf um, and that we need to leverage that. I also think um, we really need to leverage, speak, going back to, to some of what Aki was, was speaking to, the potential that exists in cities in part because of these um, realities of connectedness, connectedness, proximity, and trust. The fact of the matter is that these the problem sets that we're talking about here are incredibly challenging, um, not just because we're talking about shifts in human behavior and shifts in, in power dynamics and structures, but also because there's so much of this is deeply, deeply historically embedded. Um, and so changing that takes a lot of energy and work and dedication uh, and investment and the potential that exists in cities because of the resources in cities, because of the connectedness in cities, and because of that ability to sustain conversations and discussions over time, which helps to create trust, is huge. And where we've seen real progress in, in violence prevention, some of which is associated with organized groups, um, and illicit activity, some is less organized, you very often have um, have locations, have cities that have really invested not just in understanding the accountability mechanisms and measures that need to be brought to bear, but also in really understanding how to leverage um, and how to to deepen trust between communities, between communities and the state. Um, and, and how that is an essential component of overall both violence reduction and building more peaceful and inclusive societies, which again is the language of, of Goal 16 um, that has justice at the forefront. So my article mentions three particular cases of Cali in Colombia, Oakland, California in the U.S., and then Cardiff in Wales in the U.K., and all of these are cases that brought a range of capacities to bear um, on addressing violence challenges that really did go to reinforce the, the the resources that are available at city, not just in terms of tangible resources, but also in terms of that proximity and that ability to create trust. And it's so incredibly important um, and it's really hard. And so having dedicated people and dedicated resources is a must, uh, a must do, if you will, investment um, for all of us going forward. Great. And, and Merv, the same question to you. What, what do you think uh, some of the pragmatic and practical lessons you've learned from your research that we can apply? Thank you, John. Um, I think there, there are several lessons, um, to, to be honest. Um, perhaps uh, most listeners um, will be aware of the, of the very famous media cases of Iraq and Afghanistan and the current developments there. And um, what has been discussed in literature and also the literature I'm drawing on in the article is that um, much of these developments um, are, are happening because the interventions we set up um, years or even decades ago um, do not take the political economies on the ground uh, 
enough into account as they should. Um, and they're underestimating um, the influences our own um, aid interventions have uh, and, and um, the effect they have uh, yeah, for cities uh, and national levels um, and other societal groups, so to say. And um, these lessons that are actually out there are at risk of being repeated um, in Syria, to, to be frank. Um, so the article tries to promote political settlements theory as one potential tool for, for approaching this and finding entry points for engaging um, with uh, local political economies on the ground. Um, so, so to say that, um, pragmatically speaking, an analysis of uh, the stakeholders um, in a certain setting and seeing um, whose interests are where and which issues are up for negotiations and which um, not so much because uh, the interests and stakes are, are too high um, for that they would risk destabilizing the conflict or another violent outbreak, so to say. Um, uh, political settlements theory could um, be used as a p potential analysis tool to, to um, identify entry points. And um, uh, to then also see who to engage and um, how you can come up with conversations for changing uh, situations as they are. Um, and the article also perhaps as a, as a pragmatic lesson um, also promotes uh, that we need to be more realistic with uh, our expectations for how we can actually influence um, such settlements and negotiations on on the ground um, and that we need to use a gradual approach um, for that. By that I mean um, that once after certain conversations are started um, and in the article that's uh, on the example of housing rents and property rights um, in the issue of reconstruction, um, once certain smaller issues perhaps are tackled that these um, can open doors and be a stepping stone for further um, for increasing uh, and expanding um, negotiation topics uh, to other areas, perhaps to go from housing rents and property rights to housing rents and property rights for women, and then from there to uh, overall rights for women, so to say, or of other community members, if you if you want to frame it that way. But that um, we need a gradual approach, and that um, pragmatically speaking, um, that this needs more time than uh, is often. Um, expected by uh, political actors and by aid actors and by donors um, at the moment with programs uh, being commissioned for one to four, perhaps five years, depending on funding cycles and varying between uh, the UN system and then, of course, also bilateral donors. But um, uh, that expectations for timing and what can be achieved in a, in a, a small, yeah, in a, in a short time um need to change and that we need long-term strategies for developing these gradual approaches and to understand really who we need to talk to um, uh, for these matters and that it's that it cannot only be the um, the uh, who or who is not recognized as a um, as a state actor by um, uh, by western institutions uh, mostly but that perhaps um, for certain topics, we also need to speak with uh, politically undesirable actors, such as illicit actors, um, and that one way of doing so could be via such insider mediators. But of course, also many um, many other opportunities and instruments exist for that, as Achim also pointed to earlier. Excellent. That was super interesting, and thank you, everyone. Okay, Akim, you, you had your hand up. So, well, Akim, if I could throw it to you, you, you may have some thoughts on that as well. Uh, th th thank you, John. Perhaps as a roundup at the end, uh, I mean, what we just heard and what's, what's also in the special issue is just a demonstration of the amount of energy uh, which exists in cities uh, in order to wanting to deal with uh, violence, insecurities, illicit economies out of the energies which are in the cities already. So it's that understanding that agency, which is in the urban space, is at the heart of uh, tackling urban violence, uh, crime, and uh, in, in insecurities. And 
that very frequently happens without the recourse to the existing international understandings, norms, and frameworks which are developed. So it's very important to, to, to get outside of these sometimes these international norms that structure international discussions and the narratives that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that Rachel adhered to, to really connect to how people in the city think and act. And uh, that is what brings the pragmatic peace approach uh, to the fore, that brings to the fore how one can engage with also these urban resources and making propositions through urban peace settlements that protagonists and violence, crime and insecurities can in fact work together to work towards a different type of life in the area they control or in the area where they are. So I think understanding that urban energy, understanding that, that agency which is there, that is really at the heart of what comes out of this special issue and is surely an area of further research and for further practical endeavors. Excellent. And Antonio, maybe the same question to you as you, you think, and, and you do an imma- immense amount of work on, on, on issues of urban violence um, and militias and, and other su- very interrelated topics. So maybe you could tell us where you think the field could go next. Yeah, I think one of the challenges uh, for both for experts and for um, the practitioners and international organizations thinking more specifically about urban development and security is really how to break these um, national and, and, and strategic levels that Akin mentioned. There are, you know, uh, in terms of violence and security, the main tools for policymakers um, uh, tend to be at the national level on one hand in terms of national security and national policies against uh, crime and law enforcement and, and all of that. Uh, and in the international level, uh, actors like the United Nations and the World Bank and um, various other, other um, regional um, groupings um, tend to, of course, interact with national governments. Um, so on one hand, there is a gap in the local level because many of the challenges related to violence, uh, they not only um, manifest more acutely uh, in cities and local levels, but they also sometimes emerge from the cities themselves. So um, an example is, you know, uh, uh, the, the Jerusalem and the demands sort of uh, political and, and, and sectarian uh, sort of uh, tensions that are related to to, to the importance of Jerusalem as a, as a city, but that is a relatively extreme case. There are many other cities around the world um, fight over violence, uh, over land, and control over spaces. For instance, in, in Mogadishu, uh, is, is a very important um, thing. And in Kabul, when I visited, many former and current warlords uh, also consider very valuable to have control over some areas through their militias, through their private sort of uh, security apparatus of some areas because of the political importance of cities. So um, there aren't many um, international and, and national discussions about how to deal with that, those types of violence and those drivers of violence that are linked to the urban space. So my, um, my, my objective, my sort of uh, hope is that uh, research such as this can instruct policymakers uh, especially at the international level, to address more uh, the, the, um, the violence that erupts at the urban level. UN Habitat, which is now the go-to um, urban uh, uh, outlet at the United Nations, does an ex- excellent job, but is a relatively small uh, part of the, U- the UN that you know, provides advisory and, and, and uh, more technical expertise and research for, for countries. Um, and, and I would like to see uh, you know, international organizations uh, doing more to share lessons and to implement sort of policies and, and development that really um, tackles the, the urban level more directly. Excellent. And so, Rachel, same to you. And somebody who uh, does particularly focus on pra- practical work in the field, what do you see as the next directions for the field? So um, what I think is is really true is that uh, currently there is a lot of conversation happening Within cities, between cities, there's a lot of conversation happening with, at the national level and between national governments. And then there's a lot of um, kind of multilateral or, or international, if you will, discussions. And there is woefully insufficient space that is providing the 
what I call the connective tissue, right, or recognizing that there are um, really important discussions that have to orient around the way in which national policy influences um, and creates space for certain conditions at the city level, the way that cities um, can take advantage or leverage some of the international uh kind of norms that are advancing, that there is very little space for that. And so what ends up happening is you have advancements in conversations based perhaps on research um, or, or advocacy that are influencing in one arena, but not penetrating at all in another arena. And so creating the space for dialogue and discussion between city partners, between national governments, between international actors, UN systems, et cetera, is hugely important. Um, and I, I think of this in no better way than when I think about some of the work that I've done um, in Mexico, in particular around violence, where there's, if you don't start by understanding and recognizing just different jurisdictional responsibilities and authorities of the various different security actors, if you don't start by understanding the way in which international, and I will say particularly U.S. pressure towards the Mexican government at the national level influences um, the way that the government in Mexico City applies pressure um, to, to states or mobilizes the federal security actors and how that then influences violence dynamics um, and competition among um, what what many would deem illicit actors and state actors, then you're just not understanding the problem. And if we if we continue to sort of have these conversations in silos and in our in these um, separated kind of policy arenas, we will not get to better solutions. Um, so I would say that that is uh, of urgent need. Many others, but I'll I'll leave it there. Excellent. And, and certainly last but not, certainly not least, um, Merva, if, if you could uh, give us your thoughts. Of course. Uh, thank you, John. So um, I think next then would be really um, and what is already happening uh, to a certain extent is how, how, how can this knowledge that political economies need to be taken into account on the local level um, be operationalized into practice? Um, and there is already um, a lot of uh, debate and developments out there. Just um, uh, to, to give a few examples, the World Bank already um, last year, uh, slightly before the um, special issue actually came out, already published a, a report, uh, Building for Peace, in which they acknowledged um, many of these insights uh, and called for uh, member states and and. Um, and others to um, putting these into practice. And as far as I'm aware, um, the UK and Germany are already um, trying to follow up with this. Um, Germany just um, re recently, the bilateral uh, implementing agencies there recently issued um, reports on transformative reconstruction so, um, as an example, um, where they were trying to come up with um, concrete suggestions for how this knowledge can be put into the projects um, they are implementing. But also, um, and this again brings it then back, I think, to the, to the concept, conceptual and, and academic level, but also recognizing that there are the constraints in, in, in which they're working at, um, particularly the legal ones and political ones of the actors they are mandated to work with and, and which ones not and then funding cycles and for what uh, money can be spent and through which channels um, who one can be talked with uh, and of course also uh, media spotlight um, uh, on all of this because um, uh, political uh, and and development uh, political um, developments have been uh, following a certain path for a long time uh, and changing uh, such a path um, of course uh, re requires patience um, both from implementing agencies from donors uh, and um, yeah everybody who was part of the conversation i'll wrap up there and just say thank you to all of our participants thank you to everyone who took part in the special issue 
And I, I hope this this has been an illuminating podcast, which I think will encourage people to go ahead, go and, and read many of the articles if they haven't already. That's it for this episode of Crime Beyond Borders. I'd like to thank Achim Venman, Merve Kanye, Antonio Sampaio, and Rachel Locke for joining us. You can find the link to the special issue on Urban Peace in the summary to the show. And if you head over to our website, jayad.lse.ac.uk, you can find links to various papers from modern slavery in the Italian agricultural sector to a regular war in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Remember that it's all peer-reviewed and free to access. We're also on Twitter, at Alyssa de Cons. On LinkedIn, you can become a member of the Illicit Economies and Organized Crime Researchers and Policy Professionals Group. Currently, we have over 500 organized crime experts from around the world engaging in discussions on various areas of research. We'll be back in a few weeks with another episode of Crime Beyond Borders from Jayad and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm John Collins. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.